So we are now live. Yes. Perfect. Okay. Thank you very much. Good morning. Welcome to join. Let's wait um, just two or three minutes more in order to have more people joining. Um, and then we, we start. Welcome all, good morning. So we are just here to start this um, first fair uh, universities workshop, uh, the first of a series of university workshops run by first fair. But let's wait uh, two or three minutes more and then we start. But thank you for joining on, on time. As we expect much more people, let's wait two or three minutes maximum, then we start. So thank you for joining. So you all can see my my screen, Susanna. Right. Yes, perfect. Okay, thank you all of those that have already joined. So in one minute we start. Uh, we are expecting uh, more participants to join. So we will start uh, with three three minutes maximum, four minutes delay. But I think it's important just to wait for more people. And thank you for joining. We can have a coffee <laughs> before we start. Good morning, all. So good morning to, to Emma, Lazer, and to Vincien. Also, that they have already said good morning in the chat. <laughs> good morning, everyone, and thank you for joining. Um, okay, so we have already 60 participants connected, but we are expecting more. But let's, let's just wait a few seconds more, and then we we start the, the workshop. Thank you for joining.
Okay, so let's let's start. Then more people will join. Many thanks for joining on time this uh, first fair workshop. Um, so this is the the first uh, workshop of a series of three workshops on, on fair education in universities. This one dedicated to doctoral education programs, fair data competencies in in, in doctoral education programs. Um, so we will have two hours and a half today and tomorrow uh, three hours of, of workshop. So uh, this uh, was expected, was planned in the first fair project to be a um, face-to-face -face workshop uh, managed by University of Minho in, in Portugal, uh, but we are running, uh, running it in, um, in a online mode, uh, which is a pity <laughs> that you were not able to come to, to Portugal. Uh, so this uh, event will be recorded. Um, so recordings and then and all the presentations will be made available in the, in the event page. We will try also to share during the presentations the, the link to for you also to be able to download the presentations during the, the workshop. But then at the end, we will make available all presentations and also the recording in the in the in the event page um this is a, a zoom webinar uh, um, uh, mode uh, workshop so the participants microphones are are off but but we want you to join and to share your thoughts so later in the in the discussion you just need to to raise the hand and we, you we will give you permissions to to talk so Questions, uh, questions for the, the speakers, you can put it in the Q&A. Uh, I think it's good if we all use the chat uh, to present ourselves or to like do a kind of parallel uh, workshop, changing some, um, some messages and ideas. I think this is interesting always. And also it's where we are going to share some links during the, the, the presentations. So use the Q&A for questions, use the chat uh, to share some thoughts. And uh, to ask for to talk, uh, we want you uh, to do that. Please raise the hand, and then we give you permissions. Uh, we will. We are going to have a discussion, uh, and we we want you to to share your thoughts about to share your um, also practical experiences uh, on doctoral education programs. So uh, we want to hear you. Um, and you can use uh, first fair hashtag if you want to share something in the in the in Twitter or Facebook or other channels uh, about this this workshop. Um, I will also talk about this forum that I, it's mentioned here. Uh, invite you to participate in the forum, but I, I have a specific slide for for that. Uh, so welcome to this um, to this workshop. It's a joint uh, workshop for Sphere from from the the plan of of, of first Sphere project. Uh, so Ewa is um, is managing uh, a work a work a work package dedicated to to fair data competencies, um, and uh, uh, together with three universities, uh, we are organizing three workshops. Uh, so the first one is this one, um, dedicated to doctoral education programs. Uh, we uh, uh, we are preparing another one, a second one in September. Um, uh, that is uh, will be organized by University of Amsterdam. Uh, more targeting uh, um, professors, teachers. Uh, um, and then the third one uh, will be managed by uh, Gottingham University from Germany uh, and will be dedicated to the adoption and book that uh, in first fair we are preparing. So May, then September and October, uh, we don't have uh, right now the exact dates, but um, we will uh, for sure disseminate it properly uh, in the right channels for you to, to be aware of that um, in, the coming, in the coming weeks. Um, so it's a pleasure to, to welcome you in this first work, work, workshop. Before we start with the agenda, I just want to, to highlight one important uh, aspect. We want to have a kind of um, parallel conversation in the, between this first workshop and the third workshop 
in the in the fair data forum something new created under the umbrella of fair's fair project it's um, it's available in fairdataforum.org uh, and and then and the, and in this forum we have created a specific channel to discuss and share some uh, practices uh, use cases around um, fair data competences in universities um, so we invite you all to join the the forum uh, you can join today during the presentations or, or later today uh, tomorrow we are going to highlight more information about this but what we want really to to, to stress here that we want you if possible to share some use cases so we have like three categories under the this um, main category of fair data competencies in universities one one is about use cases in the way that um, rdm and fair data skills are being integrated in the in the in the curriculum in the educational portfolio uh, another area is about educational practices uh, what types of um, training programs do you have for um, for professional staff and for researchers um, some thoughts about that some discussion around needs and challenges and some and, and to share some some practices and the last one is about um, practical guidance uh, that um, are being delivered in Niger education institutions so this the idea is under this the umbrella of this forum to have these three subcategories uh, to promote the discussion hope that you can contribute um, I, I know that there are lots of places to contribute with information like this one but i think this is uh, this is interesting as this is something new uh, everyone is experimenting approaches everyone is is um, testing uh, everyone is thinking uh, and is planning and uh, coming up with strategies in in agri education institutions to address um, RDM and fair data skills. So I think it's interesting if we can use also this channel to to promote um, these activities. Um, and uh, with this, um, I give the floor the floor to my to my colleague uh, Bert from the European University Association, that is the coordinator in fair sphere of the workshop of the work package responsible to the fair data um, um, competences in universities. Yes, thank you, Pedro. Uh, I'm going to share my screen, which I hope is possible. I think you have to shut off yours. Yes, thank you. Um, so good morning, everyone. My name is Brecht Salem. I am a policy analyst at the European University Association. And as my colleague Pedro just said, um, we are coordinating a work package in this project. And for my welcome, uh, I just briefly want to take you from the project all the way to this university workshop. How do we get from one to the other? Um, this project, um, very briefly, this is a summary slide. This is the FAIRS FAIR project, Fostering FAIR Data Practices in Europe. Uh, it's a free year Horizon 2020 project that started in March 2019, uh, which is a very different world from what we live in today. Uh, but that means that we've been working for two years on this project so far and we're now entering we have entered the final year of that project and as you'll find out in just a minute that really uh, gives you a clue as to what these university workshops are about why we're organizing them at this stage uh, zooming in from the project this entire project with all the outcomes that are listed here is too much to sort of go into now but zooming in, uh, we are situated here in the seventh work package, which specifically focuses on fair data science curricula and professionalization is what it was called in the project application. This is about uh, bringing research data management, fair data competences, bringing that into bachelor, master curricula and doctoral training, helping and supporting universities to do more on that front that is what we're focusing on and you can see that from our objectives i'm just listing all the objectives of this work package here but i want to draw your attention specifically to the final objective of the list here which is support embedding fair data education university programs and doctoral 
training through a series of workshops and knowledge sharing activities. So you can see that this workshop where we do knowledge sharing, we do uh, bring together people interested in working on these topics together uh, is, is part and parcel of our objectives. It's part of our core objectives uh, along with the other ones that we are working on in this work package. And a different way of, of visualizing that, of what we've been doing in the last two years and, and what we're going to do in the next and final year of this project is essentially in the last year, we are now working uh, towards practical tools that are based on all the work we've done before. What you can see from left to right here on this slide is that in our work package, we've started with gathering uh, a very comprehensive and up-to-date uh, information on this issue uh, from a university perspective. We did a survey on fair in European higher education. We got a lot of good data from that. That was our basis. And we followed that up with a briefing, which was desk research on what else was out there already that could help us in, in our work and could help the community uh, in, in fostering fair data and research data management competences. Uh, and we also built a competence framework. Uh, our colleague Yuri, uh, just after me, is going to talk more about that. But this has been sort of the first two years, as I said, of this project for us, has been doing uh, all of this preparatory work in a way. And that is going to lead us now into the final year and building practical tools based on all of that work, which is on the one hand an adoption handbook uh, with uh, proposed curricula and, and, and points of attention for universities. Uh, and also a good practices report. So the William and Adoption Handbook is perhaps more theoretical in a way. It's practical. It's a practical tool, but it is sort of a generic almost su support tool. The good practices report is then very, very practical and, and just gathers and analyzes what is already happening on the ground. What can we already see that has been done initiatives that have been taken by universities and what we can learn from those experiences. So those are two practical tools that we will be publishing in December of this year. And these university workshops, uh, this one is the first one, there's two other ones, as my colleague Pedro said, will really feed into that lead up to it. Um, it's not just the presenters today, which we're very happy to have on board, but it's also you as attendees uh, and your feedback that we'll be listening to very carefully in terms of what do we need to include in these uh, practical tools to make them as relevant as possible for the community. Um, I'm, I'm including this slide because the slides are being shared afterwards, <clears throat> but these are essentially just handy links for you afterwards if you're interested to click on uh, to look at, as I mentioned, the, the big deliverables we've already produced in the first two years and then uh, also, uh, well, the link to this workshop you're attending right now. But moving from uh, the project and the work package and our objectives there to today's workshop and the focus of today's workshop on doctoral training, uh, essentially we wanna say that what we have learned already, very briefly top level conclusions is that fair data uh, even though it's been a fairly successful concept, it's definitely spread quite quickly. It is a relatively new concept. And, and with a relatively new concept or even very new concept, you will obviously have a few bottlenecks along the way before they find their, it, before it finds its way into university curricula at the bachelor master level, also doctoral training. One main bottleneck is just the basic awareness of FAIR data and what FAIR data is. I think if you look here at this data that I'm projecting here is that people, oh, I'm sorry. Uh, people saying that they are familiar with the FAIR principles uh, has gone up very slowly. That awareness has been increasing, but it's not been increasing that much. It's gone from just below 20% to just over 20% in the last three years. And there's still, of course, a vast majority of people saying, well, I've actually never heard of the FAIR principles before. That doesn't mean they don't know 
uh, anything about FAIR. They just haven't really heard of the concept and what it tries to gather and make comprehensible. So that is one big bottleneck, awareness. The second then is uh, beyond awareness, there's also just basic training. Uh, and you can see that here, there's a long list of things that clearly people are very clear on saying, well, we do need more training on all these aspects. That's another bottleneck. It's awareness, but then also the actual training of the necessary skills is another bottleneck on the way to fostering fair data uh, practices. And all of that ultimately brings us to today's topic, doctoral education. Uh, awareness raising, skills training, uh, doctoral training is absolutely essential in that story. Uh, I think with the project, uh, and I think many of you will agree, we do also say that, and we will have a workshop on this, at bachelor master level, ideally, we'd already want to see the groundwork laid. We'd already want to normalize and introduce fair data, research data management at those levels across all the disciplines so that there's at very least a basic awareness, basic skills being trained at those levels. But at the doctoral level, that is where the future generation uh, is being trained, being trained in how they will take forward their research in the coming decades. And that is what makes the doctoral level absolutely essential in this story. And I want to conclude with one key element that we gathered from our survey that we did uh, with our work package. And that is the last point there. When we did a survey asking about these things uh, at the start of this project, we had 56 out of 63 universities, 89% uh, in 2019, telling us that there is a high need to strengthen the teaching of data management competencies at the doctoral level. Uh, and I really want to stress that. I want to stress that this is a survey. Uh, the respondents of this survey were universities that on average were already quite engaged and already working at some level on these issues. And even in, among that group, uh, which we mentioned in the report is slightly skewed, of course, even there you still have 89% identifying a very high need to strengthen this at the doctoral level. So, with that being said, we are very happy to have this workshop today, starting with focusing on the doctoral level. Uh, we're very happy to have presenters on board today and tomorrow, talking about what they've already done in their institutions, how they're approaching this, what they've learned already. And this is how we can start to connect them to eventually the practical tools we'll be developing by the end of this year. So thank you for your attention. I'm going to hand it back to my colleague, Pedro, and I'm wishing you all a very nice workshop. Great. Many thanks, Bert. So let's proceed to the, um, let's say, to the, the, the first um, presentation. So we have this first part where we are sharing the um, the results of the work that we are being uh, carry on and on fair sphere uh, and now with uh, my colleague Yuri Damshenko from University of Amsterdam is a, is a senior researcher and, uh, and um, a professor uh, specialist in, 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 in data science profession and uh, also in fair data uh, in data science um, curricula uh, so Yuri uh, will share about uh, will share the work, the progress we made regarding the fair competence framework for higher education, and then we have some time uh, for questions for for discussion, and then we start with the second part of this first session of the workshop with uh, Eloy Rodriguez from University of of Minho moderating the the, the the other session. Be aware that we want your input. Think about also uh, practical examples that you want to share in the discussion after the, um, the, the panel. But now let's hear uh, Yuri Demchenko sharing the, um, the, the work that we, we did in First Fair. So Yuri, the floor is yours. You can start your presentation. Pedro, <coughs> Pedro I need permission to share a screen. Oh yeah, now I have. Okay, thank you. Uh, And you can present yourself if you yeah, want yeah. to say something okay, more I about you. Uh, <laughs> thank you, Pedro. 
for your short presentation, but I cannot make it longer because it, <laughs> yes, I, I am a researcher and lecturer at University of Amsterdam. I research on multiple topics related to modern technologies, cloud, big data, data management, also FAIR principles, and teaching a couple of courses in which uh, I always include elements of research data management. And recently I started including the FAIR principles. And I understand uh, how uh, far at least students still from implementing these principles. Also, I have uh, promoted uh, FAIR principles to my colleagues, to my uh, postdoc and uh, PhD students. And uh, in my presentation, I will uh, explain and, uh, uh, what, what we done in the project, in the a, a first fair project on defining a, how to implement research data management and fair principle in university curricula. Uh, but this, this topic is uh, just not simple just talking about a uh, fair principle, how to implement with curricula, it should be uh, included into some program, uh, into some curriculum. And uh, this uh, required us to understand university is uh, educating students and uh, demand from, for students is from, from industry. Research only one uh, area of, uh, on, only one of the, a consumer of the university uh, education services. So we needed uh, also understand what does uh, industry require from uh, a future uh, graduates on sense of uh, research data management, data management, and also how to uh, educate future profession becoming my, much more popular uh, uh, is a data steward. And uh, we, we made a market research. And based on this, we uh, identified the key competences for data stewardship and data management and pre presented this as a, a data stewardship professional uh, competence framework. Uh, so uh, in my presentation, uh, I will first go to the uh, background, some our motivation for for this uh, uh, research and uh, uh, development. And uh, just want to mention that everybody knows that uh, uh, currently there is a critical importance of research data sharing. European Commission started this initiative uh, also together this National Science Foundation saying from 2011, starting from some European documents and currently research data management is required at all European projects and the fair principle everywhere recognized also industry and research and the exactly research data alliance started 2012 to focus on uh, different aspects of research data uh, management and data sharing and the effect of this is clear uh, at the last uh, Research Data Alliance meeting, it was reported, so thanks to uh, already existing principle and the uh, approach for data sharing, the COVID data sharing became very effective and very quickly, quickly established. But uh, the FAIR is very overloaded concept and term. Uh, primarily it introduced as a set of principle for sustainable research data management, and open science. FAIR is an initiative, FAIR is a key element of the EOSC policy in Europe. And also FAIR data management is part of data management plan that is required by Horizon Europe uh, uh, and also a Horizon 2020 uh, project. Uh, every project needs to submit. And here is a, exactly is a problem and motivation because uh, we are currently also working on one of those projects where we need to present a data management plan and clearly de uh, de uh, describe how we in uh, uh, comply with fair data principles. And this happens that not every researcher, not all partners in the project understand this and understand complexity. Because 
a fair uh, principle impose a number of requirements to research infrastructure design. So this is not only data management, even it's research infrastructure design. And this slide I specifically put uh, to show that FAIR requires a quite strong technical uh, support from infrastructure, from services. The same if you look at the uh, current uh, architecture of European Open Science Cloud, EOSC, uh, so you will find a number of services that are required specifically to share data, to implement FAIR principles into data management and infrastructure. And this slide, if you see, I, don't, I will not uh, uh, go through all items, but what all items are here very technical. So need to be some services, need to be directories, need to be principles, API developed for this uh, uh, to implement the fair principle. Why I am uh, saying this? Because if we are talking about competences for and training and education for uh, uh, students and doctoral students, uh, we cannot just avoid explaining principle. They need to implement this work and further uh, promote to the uh, colleague researchers on their workplace and to the students in education. This, this is why we, we needed to approach uh, to analyze the whole environment to correctly define how to implement into a university curricula. And uh, how we did this. Fortunately, we had already uh, experience in the uh, Edison project that's run in 2015-17 that developed Edison data science framework. And also at that time, it was data stewardship uh, uh, defined as a subset of data science uh, professional family. So this allows us, us to re reuse uh, a methodology and reuse the all components of the uh, Edison data science framework to define the uh, data stewardship uh, professional uh, competences framework. And also we relied on the uh, existing development by research uh, project and research infrastructures and also industrial standards like uh, DAMA data management uh, uh, alliance that defined DAMA, DAMA book and also runs the industry certification for this. But key component of this is a job market analysis. analysis. Why? Because uh, Whatever we think at university, at research organizations, in different uh, okay, projects, still the key regulator is a market because it consumes most of output of universities and also research organizations. So we did this market analysis. I will show you in the next slide. And uh, uh, this is just showing what is the Edison Data Science Framework. It contains uh, competence framework, body of knowledge, model curriculum, and professional profiles. And all these elements works together, but key element, key uh, is a competence framework. So we started in the a, a first fair project from defining competence framework for data management and for stewardship. Uh, we did this study in almost one year. It was uh, an investigation of the uh, job market based on indeed a monster board and a LinkedIn. And based on this, I will go quickly. We uh, got what are uh, required competences from uh, data steward. The, by the way, data steward is very uh, a popular profession now. We analyzed, uh, I don't know, more than 400 different uh, advertisement. Interesting that US is a very strong uh, demand for data stewards. And uh, interest in the Netherlands is very strong uh, consumer of the, has a lot of advertisement on the data steward job. So this uh, diagram uh, shows what are competences required from data stewards. Uh, DM, data management, uh, DSC, data science engineering. And this is clearly skills and competences. Knowledge uh, are required from stewardship. So we focused our analysis 
of this information on the two major competences. Uh, one more is a domain knowledge, but this is typical uh, situation that every uh, profession need to be uh, uh, need to uh, be connected to the domain knowledge, like business, uh, medical data, financial data, and all these branches and sec sectors require the data stewards. And data stewards need to do real work this data management and possess a number of knowledge, which typically they should receive from curriculum, from education, from training courses, and so on. Currently, training on data stewardship and data management are well developed for research community, but this is still not uh, well established for, uh, say, uh, doctoral uh, and for uh, students in general. Uh, and here I, I would just to, for reference, I think if you will uh, talk, uh, consider the uh, FAIR and uh, data management, research data management in your uh, uh, programs, you may use these slides, this presentation as a reference. And this is what we extracted from uh, a job advertisement, means a market uh, demand, which knowledge are required from uh, uh, data stewards and for general data management. And based on this, this is again slides that just for, re for reference, I will not surely go through all this. And we defined a, a profile for data stewardship uh, to support FAIR principles, FAIR data management uh, in uh, six individual competences. And uh, next slide just illustrate you which what competences needed to be included into curriculum. Uh, just to uh, a make in remark, uh, competences is something what is uh, a transformed in curriculum into learning outcome. So if you uh, if the program uh, wants to uh, target the education for a data management and stewardship, uh, so learning outcome defined by uh, competences. So this is like mechanics of the curriculum design. Uh, and uh, based also on an analysis, we included few uh, more, three more competence. Uh, I, I, we call it individual competence and the uh, intercompetence group data management. And this is what uh, managing data stewardship team, uh, developing organization policy, and also data steward, as you see in strong cooperation, this data science engineering, uh, data stewards need to define also requirement to the uh, data management, uh, uh, say facilities and tools. And uh, these two slides, uh, they show uh, competences related to data science engineering, means working these tools, software, databases, and uh, managing uh, technically managing uh, data. So this is what uh, spectrum of competences. And if the university curricula want to uh, uh, address demand of market, so uh, this should be taken in, into account. And next step that we uh, uh, did, we analyzed uh, our finding represented on the previous slides. This is the existing work that is done by many projects many communities and research infrastructures. And we realized that a data stewardship competence framework by EOSC pilot, by Elixir infrastructure for bioinformatics and life sciences, also Denmark curriculum on data stewards, and also connected this compared with a data management book, body of knowledge of Dama Association. Uh, just to explain that a typically competence, competence framework or competences connected to knowledge, skills, and attitude. Based on competence, we define learning outcome. Based on knowledge uh, uh, elements, we define body of knowledge. And if needed, we profile the curriculum to the professional profiles. And uh, uh, we made a more uh, specific analysis of the two uh, uh, 
a frameworks and uh, it also shows uh, uh, this is fair for students stewardship and also data science uh, data stewardship for life sciences and this uh, gives us quite rich information what research community uh, think about how to uh, need to shape the uh, data stewardship profession and how to address fair principles. And this EOSC pilot actually defined the following set of competences. As you see, this is data management, uh, data science engineering, data analytics, and also uh, research method, research method and project management. So this is quite important part of the competences. So the uh, data steward uh, competences need to be included quite variety. And the uh, uh, competences for late life sciences from Elixir, Elixir project. Uh, also selected, separated them for three uh, groups of a, a, say stewards that will work uh, in real organization is policy defining research and infrastructure and here you see the same set of competences already split split on into individual competences uh, uh, related to policy research infrastructure and uh, you see all is uh, very much a uh, uh, put into data management and also new competences that we define related to fair principle, project management, and uh, tools requirements, and team management. And knowledge also has the same structure of the uh, competences. So on this, I would say I will finish uh, uh, overview part. And the uh, uh, data stewards, stewardship and fair principles competence profile is published as a deliverable of the a uh, uh, fair, fair, fair project. Uh, it is uh, going through the uh, number of uh, discussions and workshops. Uh, it already was based on the wide discussion. So uh, we also expect from you uh, some input, possibly for extent to the more uh, research uh, focused uh, education. And uh, I will just show you uh, currently what we are working on defining a body of knowledge and model curriculum, it's other work packages or task in the FAIRS FAIR project. And also it's related to very active involvement of community. Uh, basic for the uh, a data management a group is uh, a also a taken from Edison Data Science Framework. And this is a structure of the current a body of knowledge. And we are working and very soon we define the body of knowledge uh, for data stewardship that will also create a good advice for developing curricula and possibly also relevant to the uh, to um, uh, doctoral education. Uh, and I will also uh, give you reference to quite useful documents what uh, we used and I think it's important to take into account is a, a DAMA uh, a data management association uh, a body of data managed body of knowledge and uh, this is a big document it contains uh, like 600 pages uh, well defined and industry uses this uh, a, a body of knowledge as a basic for the uh, for a certification surely this commercial certification we are trying to establish connection this dama uh, uh, possibly it will take will happen and interesting that uh, dmbok already to, in 2009 defined the uh, data stewardship as a big part of the data governance uh, a office in big companies and at the time that we were developing the previous data management body of knowledge. I had contact with many companies, big companies like IBM, like Microsoft, and they really implement almost similar structure for their data management, uh, say, office. 
uh, uh, this slide just show example of what we are uh, developed and what I'm also given in my courses and tutorials, uh, research data management and stewardship uh, course is a uh, four sessions typically happens uh, or short of work. And on this, I will finish uh, my uh, Pedro mentioned inspirational. Uh, I hope this is also happens and gave you uh, uh, some understanding what uh, first fair project developed what achieved and what currently works in actually defining elements of uh, fair and data management uh, curriculum. Okay, and with I finish and I will be happy to answer question, uh, but please, uh, Pedro, I, I will transfer to you and uh, stop sharing. Uh, if, however, maybe people have a specific questions, uh, I will next I will open my sharing if needed. Yes. So many thanks, Yuri. Uh, so we <clears throat> we are now open to welcome your questions. There was already here in the QA um, mm -hmm. okay. question uh, request from Ellen uh, asking for you know, I think I have translated this <laughs> asking for resources I think um, I in fact I have already shared your presentation in the in the chat the link to, mm -hmm. the, okay. to the PDF and Andre my colleague Andre also shared the um, the link to the deliverable where the framework is is detailed uh, if you have any any question, uh, feel free to, to ask now. Uh, if you want to raise the hand, uh, we can give you permissions to talk if you don't want to write, uh, so feel free. We have, a, um, after the, the next panel, we have a discussion session. Uh, so we, you can also ask questions there, but feel free to to, to ask, ask questions right now to Yuri. And Yuri, if you want to say something more that you forgot to mention, just generally. Yeah, I just I can also add a couple of questions. Um, also, our experience how uh, is this kind of information that developed in a project is used by real educators, teachers, program developers? Uh, we uh, provide this information and documents as an advice. And real, surely each university, each educator, each professor, course developer, they use them as they think uh, applicable to their local conditions. So one of uh, this approach, we provide this as a advice, reference information, and you can develop this for your condition. And we are happy to support you in this. Thank you, Yuri. So there is a question here in the, I don't know if you can see the Q&A. So uh, but, uh, but I possibly yeah. difficult to identify which question. Uh, ah. No, no, it's, it's not in the chat, it's in the Q&A. Uh, uh, ah, okay. From Irina. Um, thank you, Yuri, for an interesting presentation. Data management is indeed quite complicated and deeply technical. Which elements of data management would you recommend to cover within a research in integrity training? So the question is, which elements of data management would you recommend to cover within a research integrity training? Uh, okay, uh, this is what was given in my uh, uh, final. Uh, I will be happy to share this you even slides from my, uh, say, I call this lectures or sessions, not a course. Uh, but most uh, the element, if you want to ask me what the number one is a metadata and a relation of metadata management to, uh, a, to FAIR principles, because it's really key. And next, uh, okay, there are a number of uh, courses and this is also collected by FAIR's FAIR project also activities in Research Data Alliance. But again, uh, I would be happy if the uh, workshop organizers provide some way to share a, say, uh, 
training elements so uh, or a uh, tutorials i will be happy to do this it will be quite good start point point how to start uh, this uh, in the course what you call what you say indeed irina uh, a research integrity is very important yeah great let's address one more question and then we can uh, in the discussion but, uh, panel uh, Pedro, uh, andre and andre <clears throat> wants to also add to this question i see in the q a no 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 I think... or not mm. uh, maybe not so i think andre ah, is okay. just uh, yeah cleaning the, okay. the Q&A chat, yes. Yeah, yeah. Um, there is uh, one more question here uh, from FUP. Uh, hello, I used FAIR data principles as an inference tool for assessing COVID-19 data and got the qualitative results. Then I use certified tool uh, from DENS to get the quantitative result, fairness score, 56 percent now i'm struggling to interpret this quantitative result <laughs> now i can say that um, 56 fairness score is a relatively good score is there a, is a scale to measure metric fairness score okay this is a um, quite concrete question not about the the, the specifically about the um, curriculum framework that we have presented but uh, you if you have something to say Tools are, are um, tools that are being uh, developed um, from this tool from DANS or other tools um, uh, that we also have in, in Fair, for example, Fuji tool to, to, um, to evaluate the fairness of digital objects or other tools that are being uh, managed based on the, on the fair maturity indicators from RDA are just uh, tools uh, experimenting <laughs> the assessment of, of, of fairness. Uh, so this is what I can, I can, I think this is, the, the, the tools are quite useful. But Yuri, I don't know if you have something to, to say, if not, we can move to the next panel. Um, uh, and, uh, Pedro, sorry, uh, I missed question because I was reading the other <laughs> questions. Uh, okay. I suppose you, you are in the in the chat, but if you click in the Q and A uh, tab, uh, you will see. The yes, I, I am in the Q and A. So, which questions I need to answer? From Fub, but it's a question uh, ah, you can we oh, can no, reply uh, writing. I would say I cannot say now, I cannot answer this question because uh, I am not involved in this. Yes. No. Yes. Okay, it's you answer it quite good. That uh, yes. fairness is. But I understand that fairness is a, still a challenge for many data resources. Okay, so let's let's uh, many thanks, Yuri. So I think you can uh, you will join for sure. The lawyer yes, will ask okay. you to join the, the, the discussion in the next and panel. Will... So we want to focus the, our discussion after the yeah. next panel, and for sure we will have time to hear from you also. Uh, so I invite um, I invite Eloy to to join. Uh, I will also um, share screen here. Um, okay. So, okay. Yes. Hello. The floor uh, is okay. yours. Thank you, Pedro, and uh, good morning, all. So let's uh, move forward. Uh, uh, we have a, 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 the, our next session. We we want to to discuss some uh, needs and challenges for for uh, for RDM and fair. Uh, uh, the um, further data competence uh, 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 training at, at the doctoral uh, at the doctoral level, and we'll do that by, by also by, by presenting some uh, examples of uh, 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 practical initiatives that are that are already uh, occurring. We have uh, 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 this panel with uh, three uh, uh, short, around ten minutes presentation. We can have some uh, some questions after each presentation, but then uh, we uh, at the end, as Pedro already said, we can have uh, uh, an open discussion with all the with all the, the the panelists, both from from the second one and from the the, the previous session that uh, just uh, uh, ended. So, um, without f uh, further ado, uh, I, I will. Uh, uh, um, uh, present and invite uh, 
uh, uh, uh, Maya, I, I'm sorry, I, I'm not sure if I'm correcting, uh, I'm pronouncing your na uh, name correctly. Uh, Maya uh, Miss, uh, uh, she's from the Marie Curie Alumni, Alumni Association. Uh, we have uh, something in common. Uh, she's uh, an archaeologist. I, I'm also an archaeologist by training. I, 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 I almost never work in archaeology. My my professional uh, life uh, drifts away from from archaeology, but uh, I'm I'm an archaeologist for, for training. So it's a pleasure to 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 have a colleague here on the panel. Uh, but she's really worked uh, on archaeology, and she's been holder of several grants and fellowships uh, on uh, 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 on archaeological research. And she has recently moved to to Cambridge University as a research support advisor. Uh, she's here, as I said, re re representing the Marie Curie Alumni Association. Uh, she was the founding chair of the, the of the Croatian chapter of this association. But mo most uh, even uh, probably relevant to on this context, she's uh, been working a lot on, on open science, and she was the, the leader of the Open Science Task Force on, uh, and Policy Working Group of the Marie Curie Alumni Association. So, uh, 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 Maya, I, I, I uh, the floor is yours and I will want you to, to, to present. Uh, thank you. Um, you pronounced my name correctly. So <laughs> good, good. <laughs> say this. Um, I hope you're seeing my screen as well. Yeah, yes, thank you. Okay. So uh, good morning everyone. <clears throat> I'm Maya Misha and first of all I would like to thank the organizers of this workshop for inviting Marie Curie Association and, uh, in, and also allowing me to present on behalf of the association um, the survey that we conducted among our members. So our association, as you may know, is uh, based on the researchers. We are the largest association of researchers with more than 17,000 members across the globe and from all stages of the research career, from early career stage researchers to established principal investigators. So for several years, we'll be talking about open science, but most of our talks were focused on open access. So I'm personally very glad that we moved from the open access topics to open data and open research, as well as the FAIR principles. But first, let me uh, tell you what uh, we are doing at the association. Just a quick note. Uh, the MCA has been a strong advocate for open science for past several years. Uh, we, our members, are contributing actively in the Coalition S prog uh, program. And also we um, organized the webinar on the Coalition S, which is links are available here. Um, we contributed, our members contributed to initiative for science in Europe uh, regarding the rewarding open science and how to implement open science in research. And also in a collaboration with the Foster Plus project, we organized the webinar, how to win Marie research grant with open science which is available on the MCA YouTube uh, channel. Now, for the past several years also, the open science was uh, the, one of the main topics on the association's annual conference. And we also organized uh, the session at the European Euroscience Open Forum in Toulouse. But we uh, also wanted to reach out to our members in so-called widening countries. So this spring we organized open science and fair workshop with the members of the Western Balkan chapter. And we are planning to organize the uh, workshop with the national contact points of Southeast Europe in uh, September. And this year, as uh, you may see, we Sorry, we um, collaborate with some familiar faces, with organizations, with European Commission publishers, and other research associations as well. So, um, sadly, these are the only slides in my presentation that have uh, photographs and the human photographs. Most of it, I will present the data of our survey, which I believe can complement the survey already presented by Berg on fair principles in European higher education. Uh, as I said, we are the research association, so these are the pools coming from our members, researchers, uh, from 140. For uh, 140 members responded to our research, most of them from Germany, Spain, and UK, which is not surprising since uh, these countries have the largest number of our members. 
But I uh, also also want to say that this is still a kind, uh, kind of preliminary results. We gathered a lot of data and we will be um, analyzing this data and find a way how to present it openly and fairly to everyone. Now, uh, when we ask our researchers generic question, how they are familiar with specific topics of open research Europe, uh, European Open Science Cloud, Plan S, or the FAIR principles, we get this uh, idea that they somewhat uh, know about these topics, so they are familiar, they heard of it. Uh, but what I wanted to do is to break down this, our uh, survey, into a research career stage. Um, as you may see on the right, uh, we uh, categorize them in the four different levels. Uh, R1 are the first stage researchers. Uh, they don't hold a PhD yet, so they are PhD students. R2, they are recognized researchers with the PhD, but they are not uh, fully independent. So basically early postdocs, um, R3 established researchers who develop full independency, <clears throat> sorry, R4 leading researchers and RA research administration. Some of our members are also working at the funding agencies or research administration at universities. Others are researchers who are not active currently in research, either they move to industry or they are currently unemployed. As you may see from this pie chart, most of the members who responded to our survey are the PhD students and early postdocs. Uh, when we asked our members uh, how, what they know about fair principles, how and basic concepts of the fair principles, as you may see that research administrations is, uh, knows quite well about it. So it's, it's not surprising since they need to be aware of any changes in the research landscape. Um, early career researchers or PhD students are fairly aware, a little less uh, early postdocs, and uh, established researchers are also quite uh, aware of the fair principles. Now, when we ask them about European Open Science Cloud, the situation changed. The established researchers are or leading researchers, that is, are more aware of this uh, European Open Science Cloud than the PhD students or the early postdocs. Um, even more surprising, well, to me at least, was the knowledge about the Plan S. Um, as you may see that um, established leading researchers are quite well aware of this of plan, plan S. Um, I have to say sadly, PhD students and early career researchers are not quite as well aware. And this is something that I personally want to address that we need to uh, provide the training for everyone because if we look at the leading researchers, these are our either supervisors or the future supervisors of the PhD students and the early postdocs. Uh, when we ask them about open research Europe, the picture is the graph is uh, similar. Uh, leading researchers are more aware of it, a little bit uh, more uh, are aware the PhD students compared to the early postdocs. And again, uh, uh, we need to fill this knowledge between the uh, leading researchers to uh, the uh, PhD students. Now we also ask them about training, how they did they receive the training in fair principles and their institutions. We offer them uh, four answers. So either they receive no training, basic, continuous, and extensive training. And some of them answer the question they don't know. So if they probably were not aware of the existence of such training at their institution. As you may see from the chart, 62% uh, of our members it did not receive any training. 23 received the basic training, 3% uh, uh, received continuous, 4% uh, excellent training, and 8% are probably not aware of the existence of such training. Now, our critical group here uh, is the early career stage researchers, PhD students. As you may see that more than half, 59% did not receive any training. 20% received basic training. Uh, they don't know, they're not aware of 15% and only 3% each uh, received excellent or continuous 
training. And now the second group also, I know this is not the, the workshop of the postdocs, but I think they also kind of fall into this group of uh, critical career stage. Uh, these are all early postdocs. Uh, they did not receive any training for 64%. 26% received basic training, excellent 3%, continuous training 2%, and 5 and not half percent not aware of it. So if we uh, break ask them about the data management plan that we also heard in this workshop this morning uh, a lot, um, it's kind of a half and half that uh, almost half percent, like 48 percent, did not receive any training. 34 percent received basic training. Excellent, but seven percent continuous. Also, seven percent may not be aware of such training. Four percent. Now, again, break down to the early career stage PhD students. It's quite, uh, um, let's say, a, a mild response. So that forty-four percent did not receive any training. Forty-one basic training. Uh, excellent training only 3%, continuous 20%, 12%, and don't know, no one knows. <laughs> so they didn't answer that uh, um, with I don't know. And second critical group um, is um, early postdocs. 64% did not receive any training, 26% received basic training, excellent 3%, continuous 2%, I don't know 5%. So it's kind of a, we are a little bit um, lagging behind with the early postdoc uh, as well. So we need to include them in the training as well, particularly if we consider how data management plan is in important for the career development, not only for conducting research and keeping your data and results in order and preparing them for publishing and presenting, but because most of the funders now require data management plans. So not only Horizon Europe, but also UK research councils as well. So what should uh, data management plan include? Well, basically it needs to um, address these questions. What types of data will you collect and how will you describe them? How will you store and keep your data secure? Will you be allowed to give access to your data once the project is completed? Who will be able to access them under what conditions and for how long? And two critical question is where you store your data and who will pay for the storage and for managing the data plan. And, and something that also we need to address when we talk about the fair principles and implementing the fair principles, it's time. I spoke to many researchers and they all want to share the data. They all want to uh, open their databases and uh, conduct their research in the fair principles, but they just, just don't have time for it. Most of our researchers are fellowships uh, that last only two years. So in those two years, conducting the, res uh, the research, um, gathering the data, even if you have a very good data management plan, it you will still, um, as in my case, you will still process your data uh, long before your project is finished. So this, this is something that we need to maybe address to the funders to give us um, more time <laughs> and also uh, to provide us additional funding for managing data as we see that uh, not only the storage in the data costs, but also uh, data stewards as well. So between, besides this gap, gap between the researchers and the funders, there is a gap between researchers and research institutions, not only in providing training, uh, I would say not only for the doctoral candidates, but also for the all researchers at all stage of their careers. As I said, and it's good to remember that our leading researchers are the supervisors, of the PhD uh, students and the postdoc researchers. So they kind of they need to sp split the knowledge uh, between them. And I think this is a um, good way to open this discussion. And I want to thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Maya. Uh, I think we can have uh, time for uh, one or two questions. I don't see uh, questions on the chat or on the Q&A. Uh, uh, but I, I can uh, uh, put to a question. It's a question or comment. I also I was kind of also uh, 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 struck by, by by the by the fact that uh, where the gap is more of both of knowledge and training is more is is wider is exactly on early career researchers on R one uh, research. This is really uh, uh, interesting and worrying. 
uh, because uh, you could eventually expect uh, the other way around because uh, 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 senior researchers have already been trained and have their, 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 their education some time ago. So it will be natural that, that they will not be so aware of uh, of the of more recent developments, uh, shall shall we say? But it's exactly the the other way around. Uh, what uh, uh, one thing also that I was thinking when I was uh, uh, looking at, at your numbers. Usually, we say that one of the problems, for for example, on adoption of open science, is the the conservatism of senior researchers that are used to do research in a way, and younger researchers will not be uh, able to 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 adapt new ways of conducting or more open ways of conducting research. But this data seems uh, uh, so. Apparently, there is a, a uh, there is a level of awareness, and then there is a level of adoption or openness to adopt these new things. Uh, did you explore some some of this between what is the uh, the, the, the knowledge, so if the knowledge of uh, senior researchers uh, 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 is uh, also uh, as a relation with with uh, with their adoption uh, of of the of for instance of of uh, research data management data management plans etc. Well, you raise a good point. They might be aware of it, but the other thing is that will they imply it? Uh, will they also imply it to their PhD students to? Um, uh, conduct their research in uh, on fair principles and open data spirit. Mm -hmm. So this is the one thing as, uh, and the other thing is that, that sometimes the uh, PhD students and also as I, we spoke to also our early postdocs, they're just not aware of it, um, that this uh, thing kind of exists. Uh, are, e even if um, their pro researchers are aware of it. So this, we need to also train our leading researchers to, to make them aware that they also need to share their knowledge with the PhD kind of not in the specific uh, research discipline, but also how to uh, progress the careers of the PhD students and the early postdocs. I don't want to exclude the early postdocs that are kind of in the university, they are kind of left aside, <laughs> but sometimes they're, they also need to be included in this conversation as well, so to progress in their in their career. Mm -hmm. Okay, we have another question from uh, Bigit, uh, and also then I don't know if it is a question or comment because I'm sorry, but I can't read the Russian, uh, so I can't understand. Uh, I'm sorry. Uh, <laughs> if someone can help me, I can. I can. I can, I can try it. Uh, but uh, from Bigit, uh, uh, you also asked about the content of the training. What worked best? And what is missing? Uh, this is possibly was was me. I said these are the ongoing survey. We collected the data. We are missing you. Hi, are you still there? <laughs> Yeah, I think we have a, a, prob a connection problem for some seconds, but that, okay. can can you can you talk now? Oh yeah, sure. Okay, um, okay. So now I think it's it's good. It, it's good. Yeah, yeah. Um, as I said, we collected this data two days ago, and this is still ongoing process. Mm. So we asked them a lot of questions, but I just didn't have time to process mm. all the data analysis, uh, analyze all the data. But I'm sure that we'll find a way how to present in an open and fair form all the our results. Mm. And also, we I uh, forgot to mention that uh, one way also to go is to conduct a survey with the different states, uh, researchers in the different countries. Um, because not only that we need we need to make them aware of the parent principles, but we also need to include them as well into uh, inclusivity as well. Is it, it's important. So we need to see probably how widening uh, countries are participating in implementing the fair principles compared to non-widening countries. Okay. Thanks. Uh, so, uh, Yuri, can, can you help us on translating the, 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 the question from Elena? Yes, uh, I, Elena already confirmed that I answered her question. But uh, my question is, uh, everybody see, uh, see uh, all answers to all questions? Hopefully, yes. I think so. Because if I answer one question, everybody see this answer. Hopefully, yes. Yes, I think so. I think so. Yeah, yes. What, what to Lena's uh, question, I 
answered that uh, a, a workshop organizers will provide link. I will provide links to uh, training materials, also my publications on a say methodology of data management and whatever skills definition uh, and to courses, example courses, truly. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so okay. Elena comment, Elena comment here, Eloy, is just uh, so to say thank you to Yuri for sharing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Okay. This was a question about uh, uh, okay. training materials okay. and okay. publications. So, okay, sorry, I did okay. no. I answer, but didn't translate. Okay, okay. Thank, thank you. So I think we can uh, move on. So thank you again, Maya. Uh, we will come back at the end with all the... the the panelists, so I, uh, we, we will move forward now. Uh, we will have now uh, on this session two, uh, two presentations from Portugal. Remember that uh, when we start planning for this workshop, we, we hope we are we're, uh, planning to, to have it face-to-face uh, 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 -face here in, in Portugal. So that's also the, the, the reason that uh, we, we have uh, the, these two examples from, from, from the same uh, country. So uh, I would like to, to, to thank uh, Susana Lopes and Isabel Andrade. Uh, they are uh, uh, colleagues uh, that are also working on on, on uh, uh, open science related uh, 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 things for, for, for many years. Uh, they are the colleagues from University uh, uh, Nova from Lisbon. They are both uh, librarians as, as also I'm uh, as myself. So I was uh, 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 archaeologist by training and and uh, and uh, librarian for 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 uh, uh, my will. Uh, and they, they, they will present uh, their, their experience on, uh, on the Nova University of Lisbon on, on, on doctoral education. I think it's uh, only Susanna that will be presenting. Mm -hmm. Yes, so Susanna, thank you very much to be with, with us here today and uh, the floor is yours. I will start sharing. Okay, we already see your slides. Not in presentation mode. Trying to switch up. Okay. So, okay. Um, uh, good morning to you all. And first of all, I would like to thank the opportunity to be here and to talk about Nova Doctoral School, which is a project that librarians at, at university are very much involved. I will be presenting uh, today, but this is a Three women, uh, three women uh, course. So I share it with Isabel and Antonia. And just to give you some context on um, how we managed to have a research data management course at uh, doctoral school in Lisbon, Portugal. Um, we were already involved with a very successful course uh, about information literacy, which is something that librarians often do. And we were there as a group. Uh, at the beginning, we were eight librarians uh, teaching a course. We are now um, uh, left uh, at six, I think, six, uh, yeah, six librarians. But uh, this was a very successful course with um, great uh, um, evaluation, students saying that, uh, PhD students saying that they were very happy with the contents and how we did um, our sessions. And so um, in 2015, Antonia suggested that we should propose a research data management uh, course for uh, the Nova Doctoral School. There was nothing, uh, I believe that it was, that was not a topic that was on top of anyone's agenda at the time, um, at least uh, the university, at our university. So when we suggested it, um, we had no idea if it was going to be accepted, but it was. And so we absolutely decided to grab this opportunity. And so in this uh, first slide, I'm just showing you some numbers. We started in 2015 and we are still going on with the course. Last uh, um, two weeks ago, we had the ninth edition with more than 20 PhD students. And um, we also had more than one, 150 uh, registered par participants. We have more, but sometimes the people just come to one or, or two days and then they, they felt the last one. So this is roughly the number that we have. And um, 
these participants are from more than 40 different research areas, so um, different PhDs. We have nine schools at uh, our university, so uh, we have social sciences, science and technology, economics, and um, all of these schools are um, present at this um, doctoral school and in our course. So um, we, this course is made for PhD students, or that was our idea because it is in, in our doctoral school. But because of the topic, we often get a um, researchers, uh, sometimes uh, PIs from from um, research groups, and also research managers. Which is um, it was strange for us at the beginning to have um, people that should know about the topic wanting to attend because they knew nothing about the topic. So um, it's interesting to have a mix of all three, but usually um, it's uh, mainly PhD students. So this is our course outline. We already updated um, a couple of times, and we also did something last year. It's uh, we um, switch to an online uh, version of it because this course um, usually spreads over two days because it has, um, it counts for the doctoral program, uh, the curricular uh, part of the program. So it has to have an assessment and uh, a, few, um, a minimum number of hours. So it's two days usually, but then last year we decided to, to keep going um, in an online format and we are now uh, doing six hours. So two hours a day for three days. And it's working very well. This is the outline. So we just we usually um, give it a context. We talk about open access and open science. We focus on open publishing because it, there's, uh, it's an area that um, uh, PhD students ask a lot of questions. They have a lot of doubts about uh, concepts that uh, for us, they should already know about, but they have a lot of questions about uh, how to publish in open access and um, how to uh, deal with um, APCs and all of these practical questions. Then we go to uh, open data and they talk about, about uh, the open data pilot in Horizon 2020, our Portuguese policies, uh, what is open data, open data initiatives, data repositories, which is something that they uh, know nothing about. And then we go to the research data management plans and we try to do it more uh, uh, practical instead of theoretical, but it's a, a bit difficult, but we usually um, try to get them uh, discuss their PhD topics. And it's very it's a very interesting part of the, the course. We also talk about research data life cycle and uh, for sure fair data, which is something that is usually very new to them and um, raises a lot of questions. So uh, the impact of this, um, every course has um, an evaluation at, at the end. So we are evaluated as teachers and the content uh, is evaluated also. And then there's a few questions at the end that I found uh, they were interesting to show you and to talk to you about. With, uh, and this one uh, for me, it's something that um, this one and the next one. It's um, where they state if the acquired knowledge uh, will be useful for their personal development. So more than 50, uh, 50 um, students answer that they completely agree that it's going to uh, be useful for their personal development. And um, most of the, the answers are very positive. So it's interesting that at the end of the course, they find that they are going to use the, the knowledge that they uh, received during the, the two days or the afternoons. Um, and then when they talk about professional development, you can see that the change is even, uh, um, the answers are, are even higher. So we think that, well, they, will, they are going to use it. Um, it's funny to see um, that maybe it isn't like this at all. Uh, they answer that at the end of the course, they say they're going to do it. It's interesting. They find there is a, 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 a positive way 
um, to 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 share their their research, but in the end, um, something changes. But and we I'm going to talk about it later. So this is some this is a question that is very strange to us. It's uh, the curricular unit fulfilled uh, their expectations. So they are asked about their expectations uh, at the, the beginning. They are asked uh, for uh, what they expect, what they want to learn, why they um, enrolled in the course. And at the end, they are asked if, it's, if it fulfilled the expectations. And we have a few answers saying that they disagree or they partially agree. And um, they usually explain in an open uh, answer uh, why they chose this, um, this particular answer. And it's because they had no idea at the beginning what the course was about. Even though there is an outline and inter an introduction and everything is explained on the website, the topics are so new to them that most of them don't know what to expect really. And sometimes they, uh, they uh, it doesn't match the expectation. And this is why the, there, there's a few um, negative answers. So fortunately, <laughs> Most of them answer that they will recommend the course to others. So um, as I was saying, two weeks ago, we had more than 20 participants. So it was, I believe, the highest number of participants in a, a research data management course. But as you can see, uh, a lot of them uh, would recommend it to, to a colleague. Our perception uh, uh, about the course, and as I was saying, we they feel the students feel out of form with their expectations and we we uh, we read those expectations and we try to answer those expectations when we are uh, talking to them but it's see, uh, it's easy to see that the majority of them has no idea what research data management is so when we introduce the topic of open science and open access there's still a lot of questions and then we go when we go to data there's even more questions. So what we realize is that uh, when we give them a space for discussion and we ask students to talk about their research and their data and if they ever thought about sharing it and what they uh, think it's going to be useful from their research to other researchers, uh, what we um, perceive uh, in those discussions is that there is a, a high uh, lack of knowledge on what is data, uh, when they are thinking about their PhD and their project, the research project, they have no idea what inside that their research project is data, um, that the data they collected can be useful for other researchers. Uh, they usually think that this is only important for me. It doesn't going to be. Uh, it's not going to be useful for anyone. Why should I share it? This is some some of the the comments that we have in those discussions. They also have no idea that sharing that data um, they collected advances science can help others that will not have to start from the zero. They can start from where they left, and they. I have no idea that sharing contributes to the, um, the visibility of their work. So they don't know that if, it, if, if they um, deposited uh, their data in a data repository, they can start just sharing it, um, getting feedback, uh, maybe collaboration, and collaboration is expected. So they have no idea, idea that this could happen with, um, with the, their work. So this is our perception at the end of the course. And they are usually very happy with the knowledge that they got with the discussions that we have um, during the, the sessions. Um, but in the end, we wanted to know um, if there was any real change after a research data management course. What did they do afterwards? Uh, because most of them are very positive saying, I will talk with my uh, supervisor, I will try to do something. I never thought about it, but I will try to do it. And uh, we tried to assess uh, if this course really impacted the PhD students that uh, we had. Uh, and we didn't have much feedback um, because we did it a bit, a bit informally. 
we had two or three answers saying that yes, they, they shared, but um, that was it. It was not uh, something that uh, was uh, very um, massive in answers. So uh, what we are going to do and keep trying is to have this feedback, maybe work more on this follow-up with PhD students just to see if the um, six years of the uh, uh, RDM course at doctor school has any real impact uh, with data sharing. So um, overall the feedback is very positive, but we want to know if uh, there was real impact. And that's it. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, sorry for taking three more minutes. <laughs> no, it's okay. It's okay. We have, we have time. Thank you. So uh, we have already several questions on, on the chat. I also then probably, if we have time, I also have a, a question, uh, but let's uh, look at uh, the ones that are in the chat. The, the first one is kind of a more generic, uh, generic one. I don't know if you want to, to give it uh, a try. It's about the, 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 uh, the use of rep repositories, both for publication and research, uh, and research data. Uh, Sorry, I, I, I didn't understand the question. <laughs> the, the question uh, is, uh, uh, you, you can also look at them at the, the Q&A, but the question yeah. is, do, do you think it is possible to place both scientific publications and ah. research data within one multidisciplinary repository? Are there any such examples? So I would say that Zenodo is a, a good example of a multidisciplinary repository because you can deposit data and you can deposit publications. Um, at the university, we suggest that they use the institution, institutional repository for the publications because we have a workflow established for uh, research outputs in our university. But uh, when a researchers reaches, or at least when they reach me, and I think it's the same with um, my colleagues, we suggest that they use an order for data. But yes, I think it's possible if you choose a repository that is uh, that can do that. Mm -hmm. Of course. Okay. Thanks, Susanna. And the second question is from Vincien from UA. Uh, how can we at least increase their knowledge and awareness of what is addressed in that course? Would you recommend to have first uh, to have a first intro course at a BA or MEA level? That would be something that we, as librarians, wanted to do. We are um, we were invited for the doctoral school because we um, well. A decade ago, we suggested to have something at the BA and uh, master's level. And we suggested that as a, a group of librarians and the project didn't go forward or it, it went forward in some schools and others didn't uh, catch it. But what, it, what happened and the result of that um, proposal that we did was being invited to the doctoral school. So we are. <laughs> We are already very happy with that, uh, but yes, they should know more uh, because the the intro and information on the, the doctoral website, um, the doctoral school's website is very um, complete, but we don't know why. The, maybe the topics are so strange to them and they just are counting on the, their curriculum to, to enhance their curricular. So they just do all the courses, we don't know. Uh, but most of them, they, uh, they're on, when they talk about their expectations, they are very um, straightforward with, with what they expect. But then for some reasons, they are not expecting some of the things that we talk about. I don't know. Uh, we have to work on that. We are also trying to change the, the content a, a bit more. So and update it with the, because every, Every time that we do a new a new uh, course, we have changes to do. So we are going to try and do a massive change to the, the course in the next months. Mm -hmm. Okay. So uh, uh, we have another question from Van no. uh, We will we will. Uh, uh, there is another question from uh, two other questions, but let's speak on the, the next one from Van too. Uh, uh, if they also say that they have a problem with with uh, not having time to 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 uh, to to work, to do data management. Uh, I don't have that perception. What I, what we hear a lot is that I don't know if my research is going to be important for others, and I don't know if my supervisor is going to allow me to do that. 
-hmm. but I, I usually I don't um, maybe Isabel has another perception but I, I think that they don't say that they don't have time they just say that uh, maybe it's not that interesting or yeah it's mainly that okay Isabel do you want to add something on this no, no, I think that uh, uh, Susanna is right. Uh, our perception is not really uh, if we are go not going to have enough time to do this or that. It's really because they don't know. They don't know anything about it. And they always wonder about uh, the supervisor's permission and so on. So, no, thank you. Okay, thank you. So a question from Emma. Uh, is the material that you use for a course openly available? Uh, not really, because it's... Well, maybe Isabel can answer this better than me, but I think it's because it belongs to the doctoral school, so we don't share it. <laughs> well, it's, uh, it's a little bit worrying because we are really speaking about open science and we have a, a doctoral course, a doctoral program, all courses in the doctoral school are um, have a, a policy saying that we shouldn't uh, at least uh, have all courses available, especially all, all uh, exercises and practical stuff. Uh, but we are going to try to change that policy. Now we are going to have a meeting next, uh, next week. And one of the things that uh, Suzanne and I are going to stress about is open science is mm -hmm. having everything there. And we share and with the students. Okay. We, we share, share everything with the students. The <laughs> students have everything. Uh, uh, but uh, you know, PDFs of our things, they have a, a Moodle platform where it can go and access everything, but only the registered participants, okay? So we are going to try to change it and have this, this uh, challenge, which is going to expose our <laughs> material uh, and uh, welcome the feedback of our pairs. Yes. Okay. We have two final questions we need to move forward, so, but I will ask you to, to reply quickly to, to these two final questions. One is there is difference between the fields of research on the perception yes. of students, and the yes. other one is if there are incentives for doctoral candidates to, to practice open science. There's different perceptions depending on the research fields because, uh, because of what I was saying before, they have difficult to see that what they're doing is data or can be translated in data to be shared. Social, social sciences, they usually say, oh, I just have a few Excel files, I, I did a few interviews, and it, it doesn't matter. And as uh, life sciences, they have a different approach because they are already used to publishing journals that ask for that data. Um, so it's different from social sciences and life sciences, for sure. Mm -hmm. okay. uh, I don't think so. Uh, incentives for doctoral candidates to practice open science. No, we don't have any incentives for open science in our university. Mm -hmm. Any. Okay. Thank you, Susanna. I, I will keep my question to, to for the final uh, for the final uh, debate. So uh, let's uh, move okay. on with uh, with Pedro. I think uh, uh, I don't need to present Pedro, but anyway, I'll I'll I'll, I'll do it. So Pedro uh, works uh, here in Minho University is uh, currently the, the head of the, the, of the, uh, the unit that is responsible for uh, the management of uh, research information, uh, open science uh, and repositories. And he's been working on this area for, for 10 years. And of course, he's uh, the, 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 uh, been deeply involved on first fair project uh, since the beginning. So Pedro, thank you and the floor is yours. Hey, many thanks. Hello, so uh, I'm going to present here um, um, another initiative uh, from, from Portugal specifically uh, about um, an RDM MOOC that we, we did um, uh, in 2019 that is running now also, uh, that was running in 2020 and 2021 uh, and it's, it's available in a, in a national pl platform. Uh, I can also th then at the end also highlight some things from the, the strategy, the RDM strategy in Minho. Uh, but what we really want to share is this uh, initiative because it's not a, a, a specific institutional initiative, but it's 
a, a, a training initiative that was delivered uh, to, um, and offered for the higher education institutions in Portugal, for, for all the institutions. Um, it was led by Minho, but it, it was uh, um, something uh, uh, from the, the um, under the umbrella of the, of the Ministry of, of Science and Higher Education that have asked their General Secretariat for Education and Science to, to prepare a MOOC and um, the General Secretariat of Education and Science asked Minho to, to prepare it and, and to deliver it. Um, and the main idea was to, to, to prepare um, around 20, 30 hours MOOC to support uh, the training of, of doctoral students. Uh, and in fact, the initial idea was that all the um, doctoral students that uh, were beneficiaries of uh, uh, funding from our national and major funder, FCT, should um, they should um, be obliged to do this MOOC. This is not the case at the end. So the MOOC is available for all um, young researchers and doctoral students and for all the Portuguese community. It's not something that is mandatory for doctoral um, uh, students that are beneficiaries of, of, of the, the FCT of the funder. Um, but it's a, something like a recommendation. Uh, so the target was really, uh, so we, we prepared the course for young researchers and doctoral students, this was the idea, and it's something that is serving all uh, Portuguese uh, higher education institutions. So we did already two editions of, of this MOOC, and I think it's an interesting experience, um, not, not, not on in the side of the content, because um, RDM basics or essentials of RDM, there are several approaches and several courses being done and being offered in different countries in different institutions. But I think as a national MOOC, I think it's uh, um, quite uh, an interesting, uh, I think, initiative to, to share. Minu, Minu was responsible for that uh, because Minu was a bit a uh, pioneer in open science in, in Portugal, is quite involved in different uh, in different European projects and in different national uh, infrastructures and initiatives from the scientific information infrastructures to the, the training and dissemination. So we are also participating in FAIRS Fair, but we, we were the coordinators of FOSTER. So there was a, um, a big expertise from, 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 from Uminio to, and this is why the, um, the, the Secretariat of Education and Science um, from the Ministry asked Minu to, to deliver and to prepare this, this uh, research data management MOOC. We call it in, in Portuguese Essential GDI, which means RDM Essentials, basically. Um, uh, and it's a MOOC uh, that is um, so that was prepared by Minu for the Secretariat of, of Education and, and Science. And it's and it's uh, a MOOC that it's part of um, a MOOC national platform. So the, the, the computation unit of, the, of our major funder of Foundation for Science and Technology, uh, FCT, have a national platform, the name is NOW. Um, and this, in this national platform, there are dozens of MOOCs that were start to be prepared in 2019. In fact, our MOOC was one of the first MOOCs of this platform. Now it's in the second edition and there are already dozens of MOOCs targeting different uh, different areas and uh, there are not so many MOOCs targeting the um, higher education uh, institutions or students, uh, but this is one of the MOOCs. So this platform is, is in fact part of a bigger project to, to promote digital skills in, in, in Portugal. Um, so we did the first edition we delivered in the end of 2019, and it was like for a, 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 a semester from, from December to June. Uh, we had um, 1,600 participants, uh, 430 uh, obtained a certificate. So it's important to say that the certificates are already are only um, delivered if the, the, the participant um, uh, do the six models. So 
there are several participants, hundreds of participants that they, they come to the MOOC just to do one model or, or two, or just to see some things uh, uh, and they don't get the certificate. Others that don't finalize the MOOC, it's true, but there are uh, hundreds of, uh, at least half of the participants just, just get one of the, of, of the models done. Um, and the numbers were quite uh, interesting. We were quite happy with the results. Uh, now in the second edition that in fact is running until the end of June, uh, we have already close to 2,000 um, participants and over uh, 500 uh, are already get certificates. We only have um, uh, data on the evaluation of the participants from the first edition, not the second edition yet. Um, but the numbers are quite good for Portugal and then the um, and and uh, in some cases, in, in some institutions, were quite uh, a surprise for us the, the uptake of this of this MOOC. Uh, the format is six models with around uh, thirty hours. Um, in fact, from the first assessment we did, half of the persons said that they did the the um, the, the MOOC around between twenty to twenty five hours. Um, so it's a it's a normal MOOC. It's 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 done in in the in the open open uh, platform uh, where the where the all the MOOCs from this national platform are done. Um, uh, we have text, videos, diagrams uh, with CC by licenses. Um, we, the the target is really doctoral students. So, uh, but we know because this was one of the first kind of training materials around RDM that other professionals are, are doing this um, this MOOC. So research support staff are also doing this, this MOOC. But all the idea around the, the content of each of these models was to offer training to, to doctoral students. Um, I don't need to detail this, this slide, but the goals were more on the um, on sharing uh, on uh, presenting tools, uh, discussing some things around the legal issues, um, focusing on data management plans and, and the kind of introductory things to fair data and, and research data management, but the focus are also in the requirements of the main funders, that is something really important. So the models were six, one introductory, then one focus on data management plans, another one on, on organization of data, documenting and organizing data. Data licenses and data protection. One, the one that is that have more um, effort in in terms of time, let's say, and in fact that was more difficult to to prepare <laughs> uh, because it's quite difficult to from the, the the data protection to define what is really the basic thing. Um, sharing and depositing data in repositories. The the other model in the last one was was uh, related with the funder uh, requirements. So the more or less the so what we have in the in the MOOC is that we have uh, some um, lessons for each model. We have one lesson with a video recording. We have some videos with uh, like one one minute video with the essential of a specific part of the content. We have some external references also, and of course we have text. We we try to. Um, to, to reuse some graphics, these graphics are well known in the in this area, preservation and, and research data management, and to try always to prepare some graphics and to present things in tables, um, quite visual in order because this is what is really important in terms of of MOOCs. Um, we always when we present the MOOC, we always say that this is not a MOOC for specific disciplinary needs, because this is important. When we talk about the basics, the essentials, it's quite difficult to get into the details of some specific disciplines. Um, it's not also a course for senior researchers, so this is why sometimes we need also to clarify that. Um, but 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 is really a valuable course, and it, at the end, based on also the, the uptake and the assessment that we did, it, it's quite quite a useful a useful resource so to finish my presentation some 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 information about the, the assessment that we did and the lessons learned um so i think that we were quite happy at the end uh, and during also the second edition that we the, the target uh, 
audience, we, we, we were quite happy. So half of the participants are really doctoral, doctoral students or master um, students, um, which, is, which is really, really great. Um, and, uh, and, uh, and, and we understood that this was, we prepared this course for, for Portugal, but we understood that this, it was quite important also from, from, some, from some people from the Portuguese um, speaking countries. So from Brazil and from Mozambique, we have already a very good number of, of people participating. Um, the MOOC platform is always, it's interesting because we can, um, we can really, via the analytics, uh, we can um, investigate a bit more the, the way that the participants are playing with the content, are watching videos, are accessing the platform. So we try to do some assessment during the, um, the, the, the first edition. Um, and uh, at the end, we did, uh, we did also a survey. I think we get a very good, almost half of the participants that get the certificate reply to our, to our survey. And um, the degree of satisfaction was really impressive for us. We, we were quite, um, quite happy with the results. 91% uh, very satisfied or fully satisfied. And one of, we asked also some questions about how useful were for the, um, for their profession or for their activity of research, and the and the eighty percent indicates that it was quite uh, very useful or uh, with high impact on their on uh, on, the, on their research or, or profession. So to finalize some lessons learned, what the first what the first one dedicated only to the content itself of the MOOC. I think some of you are also doing this kind of online courses. So the format the format. Uh, uh, as we know, for the MOOC, it's quite important the the videos and the and the graphics and the images. So we improved a bit from the first edition to the second edition. We, in fact, we did I think a good MOOC, but it's not so powerful in terms of visuals because we didn't have the 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 budget and the effort <laughs> sufficient to do that. But I think we we were quite. Uh, happy uh, with the results and in terms of content what was quite important for us and it was also important to have the the contribution from the managers of the platform was to have a clear content structure with brief blocks of content this is what is really important in terms of delivering a MOOC um, the conclusions and the, the lessons learned from uh, what we take from the assessment and what we take also from some discussions that we already present the MOOC in several training workshops in Portugal or in some presentations that we do do researchers. Um, the type of training resource like a MOOC, uh, a basic, uh, an RDM basic MOOC, it's quite, it's something really uh, see as a benefit because it's something that the universities in Portugal don't have so much. And uh, so we were aware that um, research um, vice directors of research in several universities invite their researchers in their institutions to to um, follow this MOOC, to watch this MOOC and to, and to, and to access this MOOC, which, which was quite important. So this type of training resources are quite helpful, uh, but they are just generic. So generic content is important, but at the end, we see that the more discipline specific training material is needed. So because we had a feeling that for some researchers at the end, they will ask for more. For policy infrastructure and, 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 and framework, some lessons learned. I think the MOOC was quite important. Uh, the function for basic training was achieved, but it's always important to say that if the institutions don't have a policy context, don't have tools and services to offer to researchers, then this kind of training um, fell into a, into, a, into a wall. <laughs> um, because it's important to, if, to have some tools, and, uh, some tools and infrastructures available. Because if we are talking about deposit research data in the repositories, if we are talking about data management plans, these kind of things, we need to offer them the tools. And this is important. This is why, just to finalize, and this is just 30 seconds of slide. In, in Minho, the, we have this, um, this, um, this strategy that we prepared with the, the rector in 2017, 2019. So we are now delivering block by block uh, slowly, but we are, we are doing so. We have already an open data repository. But it's important to understand 
that the training needs to be embedded of course in the curriculum but also embedded in a in a larger picture so where we have uh, um, support and consultancy for for data protection policies infrastructures we have services and the training need to be embedded in this um, in this ecosystem of, of um, in this framework of infrastructures and policy because without this it's quite difficult to that to to, the, to have all the the positive results of the training So okay. it's the end. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Pedro. Uh, we have already some questions on on the on the chat on the quick Q and A. But sorry, uh, the first one is uh, again more generic. But anyway, you might you might uh, want to to reply, Pedro. And then there is a second one uh, that is both to 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 you and and Susanna. Mm -hmm. Do you want me to read or can you read it? No, no, I can, I can read it. So the first, the, the first Rune Pinto about the, the practices on, on depositing the thesis and dissertations in, in repositories. So if there are plans for a campaign to raise awareness. Um, in, I, I, at the national level, I don't think there are clear plans for a, to raise for, for a campaign, but I know that in some institutions there are some campaigns. And I understand this is a critical issue in some institutions. There are ratios of compliance with these rules in Portugal for depositing theses and dissertation that are really high in some institutions, but small in others. But this is something mandatory. So this is in the law in Portugal. So everyone needs to deposit theses and dissertations in repositories by, by mandate in the, in, the, in the national law. So uh, I think this is important. Thank you for the question, Ronnie Pinto. So Stephanie, um, question uh, to Susan. Yeah. So, so let's let just compliment on, on, on yes, your it's answer. important <laughs> on your answer because uh, uh, the, the question is is also not only the compliance of depositing on repository but also on providing open access. So okay. uh, I, I know that for instance in some institutions like Nino, we have we started that uh, a year ago to be much more strict. On, on on allowing theses not to be openly available. So the rule is that all theses and dissertation must be openly available, and to be closed, they have to have a, 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 a formal authorization by the rector. Right. So it's a vice rector level that uh, that needs to be to authorize that the thesis is not uh, openly shared. So because there is there was already or really also here in Mino a high number of theses that were uh, not openly uh, 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 okay. Hey, Thank you. Yes, yes. Um, I have already replied to one question. That's Open edX. I don't know. Uh, so it's the the platform that uh, we did where we did the MOOC, and it's a platform that is 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 part of this national platform of MOOCs in Portugal. The question about to what extent do you touch upon fair in RDM essential course? This is a quite important question, I think. <laughs> um, we we talk about fair only in two in two models: the the introductory model, where we have a, a, a block of content dedicated to fair, and then we touch in fair in the last um topic about the the funder requirements because this is needed for uh, at least the horizon 2020 requirements uh, but this is quite important question that everyone that is preparing these basics uh, of rdm uh, if we go to i think it's quite difficult to do a short course on rdm if we want to touch in fair uh, we realize that it's not sufficient. We don't have enough time to do uh, a proper approach. This is my opinion, My also based on some, some work with some trainers. I think it's quite difficult. Introductory courses on RDM. Usually I decide to have, okay, I have one slide presenting the FAIR principles, but that they say, if you want to know more, go to see this, or I can talk about fair data in another course, not in the basic things. I think this is important. This is a, an important question when we are thinking about introducing fair data in this kind of um, curriculum. And, 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 and I think for sure, short courses um, on the basics, we can only have an introductory approach. If we want to have more, it should be a more detailed courses. In seminars, in, in doctoral schools, I think it's possible to do more 
but then it's to balance Susanna can reply it's the, we need to balance the time that we have yes. <laughs> for and each we also, yeah. we also do that we explain what uh, what what fair means uh, what is expected from uh, researchers when sharing why it's important to be fair or to follow the uh, fair principles and because it's an introduction we um, what we usually do is when people have when students have questions or we think that they might have questions but at that moment they cannot uh, explain what they need we always open um, place for further discussion after the course and the, at that time we usually have more uh, questions on specific topics but we do an introduction and we explain what 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 it means and how important it is to, to follow the fair principles and that's basically it Okay, thanks, Susanna. The, 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 there is another question from Susanna uh, Sutter Sanson that I, I think it might be a, a, a it's a very interesting question. Might be a, a good point to also to open up to so this question to open up to to all the speakers. So I, I now invite also Yuri Brecht and and Maya to open up the, the, the cameras and maybe uh, if you all want to address this relevant question and we also have here a Mentimeter that Pedro is already uh, uh, sharing. Uh, um, and, uh, so if you uh, go to menti.com and use this code 54832125, maybe also Andrea can put it on the chat. Uh, uh, so while, while we still uh, uh, address and discuss this question of uh, Susanna and, and eventually others, you might also want to, to reply to this, uh, to this question, what are the main needs and challenges for, for development action plan uh, at, your, at your institution? I can start replying and then the others can join uh, as, as I finish my presentation. I can share with Suzanne and many thanks Suzanne for your interest and for your participation in this workshop. Um, at the end of, of, of the, so uh, assessing the, the MOOC that we did, uh, my conclusion and we have already presented in the RDM forum events in Portugal, the, um, we realized that uh, it's important to prepare a MOOC uh, that targets some disciplines in, in, in Portugal also. So we already invite people in our RDM forum community in Portugal to please um, be aware that um, a follow-up on this generic MOOC is important for these different disciplines. Uh, I, think, I think one of the reasons for your question, so why we don't have so much discipline specific training materials that I think we all these kind of materials are uh, under the, um, the umbrella of research infrastructures, which makes sense uh, in, in some research in European research infrastructures. But I think it's important to realize that the researchers from this specific disciplines are in the institution, the doctoral students are in the institution. So we really need to prepare this kind of materials and to offer also in a, in a, um, in a in an approach like like we did for, with the MOOC, in Portugal there are some interesting initiatives from Biodata that is the the, the Portuguese node for Elixir. Elixir is doing this kind of, of of as you know this kind of trainings, and there are some interesting initiatives. But I think we they, they always see it as a kind of um, face to face um, training um, initiatives, and not so much as a uh, this kind of good online training materials that can serve everyone. But I think for sure in Portugal, this is a challenge that we are raised to, to, the, to the community. Thanks, Pedro. You, any other of the panelists, of the speakers that want to, to jump in on this? If 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 not, I I I have a, a, also a, a, a question uh, that uh, is probably uh, addressed. It was that initially addressed to I plan to address to to Susanna, but is also uh, now addressed to, to to everyone. And I think Pedro also mentioned that on the end of the, of his presentation is uh, when when we do uh, uh, education and and training. Uh, 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 so we try to assess the impact and you try to assess the impact 
on on uh, on the practices of of people but also uh, i what i like to to ask especially for for the for nova university is that it, it um, was also an impact on on the expectation of of uh, phd candidates for instance on the level of services and tools and infrastructure for for research data management because again if we talk about uh, data repositories to deposit data or, or or tools for data management plans it will be probably natural that people will expect to have tools and services to provide uh, the, those services to to them what what do you understand as being the, the impact of training also on on the expectation and uh, of uh, of uh, phd candidates so we don't have those tools in uh, our university and we are not uh, at all planning it for the near future um but we during the course and especially on uh, isabel's session she talks a lot about tools and also um we talk a lot about uh, um, research data management plans, uh, a lot of tools. We present a lot of them, explain how they work and what they are for. And uh, we give them the opportunity to even try in class um, when the courses are in person. Online, we don't have that so that the online version is not very long. But we we talk about, we present a lot of tools, a lot of them, and we explain uh, the, usually we even focus on um, uh, subject specific tools because we have people from, um, participants from the different schools, life sciences and, and um, health sciences and social sciences. So we try to present tools for uh, specific for their research areas because we know in advance uh, their areas, of course. Uh, and we try to present them, but we don't have any tools at the at university. So we are not planning to have a data repository. Uh, we are not planning anything uh, uh, regarding this topic. It's not something that we don't want to do. It's something that we don't have um, uh, an opportunity to do. <laughs> and as I was, exchanging a few messages with, with my colleagues on the with the phone um i will not go very much further in that because this, this session is being recorded <laughs> so um we don't have support we don't have the support as you have in your university to do more uh, this is what we can do and we never give up we keep on doing it uh when everything uh, at the doctoral school turned to online um most uh, professors gave up on their courses and we kept doing it. So we, f we thought it was important and we kept doing it. But we don't have um, that support that is needed from the university to have or to develop uh, other type of repositories or have our own data repository or whatever. We don't. But we give those, we list a lot of tools uh, during the course so that they can check them, uh, check them out, try them and select the ones that they found, find best for their work. I don't know if I answered the question. <laughs> yeah. yeah, thanks. thanks I don't know if I can just uh, give yeah. a, some clearance about the infrastructure and openness and fairness. Um, I was fortunate enough to do my fellowship, two year fellowship at the UCL where the infrastructure is available. So we had very detailed data management plan and also repositories are available. So all these tools were really available to me and I have to give a big shout out to the UCL Open Science um, Office that they opened it recently. Uh, but this one thing that we need to distinguish is one is to be open and one is to be fair because it is time consuming uh, to be fair, really findable, interoperable, um, to publish your data in such way. So that's why I mean, mean when I speak to many of my colleagues, researchers, postdocs, they said, yes, we want to be open, but to implement fairness in the openness, it's time consuming because it needs to take time and the postdocs are mainly either pursuing their research career and applying for the another research grants or applying for job positions. So it's kind of, we need to take that into account when we talk about um, openness and fairness. So mm -hmm. thank you. Thanks, Maya. 
And I don't know if uh, uh, any other of the speakers want to comment. I just uh, maybe I can uh, drop out some also uh, uh, follow uh, follow up on, on this uh, discussion. Uh, uh, the results here from the Mentimeter, and also there was also a comment on on the chat. I think uh, the question of uh, infrastructure training and and, and uh, policy is is really. Uh, important uh, and the need for alignment of, of these things. Uh, uh, that on the comment, I think it was from Eva that also talked about incentives and incentives and rewards is I think it's really very important. It's not showing up very, uh, very high on the on the Mentimeter replies, I, at least for what I can, what I can see. But uh, I, I will also uh, ask for kind of final uh, Comments on this uh, on this uh, on these aspects. Uh, so uh, on on the, the need to 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 and the importance of the different components of uh, of these different elements for for promoting research data management and, and fair, fair data. So infrastructures policy and 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 uh, um, training, but also incentives and rewards. So I don't know, Brecht. Uh, Maya, yeah, Brecht, you have already raised your hand, please. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I think this is a this image that we're seeing now. The, the word cloud is very interesting. It really harks back to what Pedro also mentioned in his presentation. Um, what I understood in his presentation that really struck me was uh, universities can take a lot of initiatives in this field. They can do a lot of things here. Um, but what we're seeing here is just that okay, universities will cannot be the only ones working on this you know if you look at infrastructure mm -hmm. etc okay these are things that not every individual institution can just do by itself there's there's capacity limitations there's financial limitations sometimes uh, so it is going to have to be across different levels different stakeholders working together and it also goes in the other direction at the same time i think also national uh, or maybe even european initiatives uh, can do a lot there's a lot to be done on that field but then ultimately longer term those initiatives will also have to be integrated at the institutional level again so it's really about different levels finding each other and i think this this image i think is sort of the perfect illustration uh, if you look at the different things that are in there okay thank you yuri yuri oh. also want to talk i yeah. want to comment uh, i was following uh, this from the beginning of mentimeter and one of the first biggest items was uh, awareness of university management and next followed by other administrative related issues. Uh, I will not directly answer. I think it's a very important uh, issue. I uh, just mentioned that in industry for establishing data management in industry, they clearly claim that uh, awareness of uh, management is important for implementing uh, good data management in companies. Why? Because data, data are a horizontal issue for company. And uh, the first uh, uh, barrier on implementing in industry data management is uh, the barrier between departments. So management still continue to be very important issue for establishing uh, good data management, possibly also education. Thanks, Yuri. Okay, I think we can move on. Also, we are can, can uh, running out of time. So we would like to, to also to, to, to know from, from the participants what are uh, uh, your experiences. So what, what is going or what is already going on uh, 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 at your institution uh, regarding uh, 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 education for doctoral students or related to RDM and, and, fair, and fair data. So, uh, and <clears throat> so we will ask you to, to use the same uh, Mentimeter code and also to, to raise your hand uh, to, to shortly present in two or three minutes uh, what, uh, you, uh, uh, what you are already doing at your institution. I, I saw that during the, 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 the event, uh, uh, at least one person uh, was uh, Eva uh, uh, mentioned on the chat uh, 
uh, what uh, 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 they were doing at uh, our institution, but uh, others are also invited to, to, to present. So Eva, uh, you let, can... Yes, yes, so Eva already have permissions to... to... Okay, so uh, yeah. please, please go ahead, thank you. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Yeah, so uh, morning everyone. Yeah, I would like just to share that we are now running the Doc Enhanced Stewardship course. So this is developed in the U, uh, U project Doc Enhanced and should be also openly available to all. And uh, we have three modules. First one was, let's say, MOOC or e-learning, like theoretical part. Then uh, there was, uh, or, uh, like today, right now, there were workshops with more practical things for doctoral candidates. And in the third part, we will have some European uh, overview of the policy, national policy, and also engagement with uh, industry, like what are the requirements outside, uh, outside uh, the academia. And uh, just to give you an example, we are also trying in the Czech Republic use because let's say uh, regarding data management tools, there are many, many tools available. And this is hard for researcher to choose the right one. So at least we would like to uh, apply, or we are piloting this data stewardship wizard, which is the online tool, it's open source, and can be adaptable to different uh, disciplines and can be shared and can be used uh, during uh, the project at the beginning, at the end. So this is that we are working right now on, uh, on it. And what is missing right now that we are training these PhD candidates, but no one is requesting here like to, to have the research data management or to share the data. And there is also issue with maybe their supervisors because they are not aware of these practices. So it's nothing that they will be supported by, by many of them. Thanks, Eva. I don't see any more raised hands. But because we, I think uh, from, from what I've said, I just want to highlight two things that maybe someone, maybe, maybe you and Eva or my colleague Andre can also share the link to Dopinia's uh, um, project web page. Um, and um, the, the other thing is that tomorrow we have someone uh, representing uh, Dopinia's in the in the workshop. Uh, so we, we, to better detail this, this um, and this, the results of this project and the RDM training uh, that they have. But we have already here a, a, an example <laughs> from Eva that someone is in fact uh, putting into practice these outputs from Dauphinian's project. Great. Uh, I would be especially curious to see, we have eight replies of other types of, uh, of initiatives. Uh, I would be really curious to, to, to know, uh, uh, so I would invite the, the people that have replied uh, uh, also for for every of the of the of the types but especially for the other types as uh, if you can uh, tell us uh, something of uh, of what you are doing at your institution that will be great uh, hello uh, i i answer at other types mm, one of yeah. my answers and uh, okay. this is actually what i mentioned in my presentation I include uh, data management, research data management, and FAIR in uh, my uh, courses related to big data, to mm -hmm. data management. And even in the first year students, I imply some requirements that comply this, uh, how they manage their files, uh, submit their task, uh, their uh, assignments. Okay, thanks, Yuri. I also gave permissions to Susanna since uh, see if, if Susanna want to, to, to speak. Not Susanna Lopes, the other Susanna. Susanna Sansa, yeah. That also here, if she want to, to say something, and she was quite active in the chat. Uh, thank you, Pedro. No, I don't don't have any any specific comment. I think in general here in Oxford, there is also a lot of, uh, of work. We have, we've done a big uh, research data management uh, survey in terms of understanding the provision that exists, what, what actually user wants, what research wants, especially in the dis different disciplines. Because like, like the comments I made earlier, there is a lot of very generic material, which is very good, it's diverse. It would be nice if you know it was more co coherent and consistent, but I guess we're gonna get there 
closely, but I think the clear gap is within the different disciplines. And even in the life science where a lot of things exist in the life science themselves, there is a lot of sub-disciplines and obviously, you know, different data type have different requirements and that's hard to make courses or training material that's um, in the different area. But I think that's what we need to do to really give practical guidance to the different searchers because that will, that will really make sure that they are listening because the data they're working with is what they want example for. Mm -hmm. Susanna? We also have here a, 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 a comment on the chat from Theo Delft. Uh, uh, they run uh, software and data carpentry workshops and, uh, uh, and data stewards provide training at their first faculties uh, on RDM uh, besides the centrally provided RDM uh, course. And they are preparing uh, code refinery workshops and uh, uh, and uh, and uh, okay, we can you can read it on on the on the chat. So thank you, Paula. But again, uh, for, for the results here, for, uh, 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 I think it reinforces the, the, the impression that we uh, we uh, we already have from the previous uh, panel and discussions that uh, what uh, we have already a lot of uh, RDM basics uh, 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 initiatives. They are still needed and, and useful, but uh, as also Susanna has, has commented, uh, there is uh, there is a, a need uh, uh, to have uh, more uh, um, targeted uh, 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 and advanced level uh, training, especially targeted at, uh, to to the different disciplines and addressing the <laughs> different needs and requirements. So I don't know, Pedro, if uh, we can. I was just, uh, I think we can move forward. I was just giving also the floor to Paula Martinez if she wants to say something. She, she said in the chat, so <laughs> but if she wants to add some, something. No, I think, thank you for giving me the, oh, I don't have the camera. Uh, yeah, doesn't matter. Um, no, I think, uh, well, at TU Delft, we prepare in 2019 a vision for RDM training because, as uh, Susanna said, there is uh, different needs between disciplines, even at the same institution. Mm -hmm. The faculties have different needs. And then we uh, try to um, um, create or envision different. Uh, levels of uh, content specificity of the different courses we would like to provide. We are trying to implement that vision. We very soon realized that there is a high demand for any of the courses we provide. So at the moment we are lacking the resources to provide and fulfill the demand. But I do think that uh, RDM is one aspect of FAIR. Uh, but there is this need of uh, tailoring and providing a bit more specific hands-on workflows uh, um, training as well. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Paula. So if no one more wants to, to take the floor and share any of the uh, initiatives that you are running at your institution, Maybe we can move forward. So, uh, Pedro, maybe you can wrap up and uh, present what will happen yes. tomorrow. Yes, uh, uh, before, uh, so Berg can also join me and then and invite people for joining tomorrow. This is a, a workshop. This, the idea was to have one day workshop. Online is quite difficult. So, we are dividing this into sessions into different day, days. Uh, but I will give the floor to, to Berg to present the day that we have tomorrow. Before, Berg, I just want to highlight again, if you want to join the, um, the forum, so join fairdataforum.org, there is a specific category, um, fair data competencies in universities. The idea is that we discuss a bit, we share some use cases, good practices in, the, in this forum related with what we are working in universities. I think this will be important. The, 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 this forum information will be also important for the good practices um, report that uh, we are preparing in the in first fair project. So feel free to contribute. I hope that we can contribute. The idea is that as we have three workshops, 
May, September, and October, we can use this forum to for a parallel conversation. Um, so I hope that we can we can use it. Uh, so Berk, I don't know. Um, you want to invite people for tomorrow? So we, we start at I, 10. I'd love to invite people to join tomorrow. Uh, thank you, Pedro. Um, so as Pedro mentioned, uh, this is a two-day workshop. Uh, tomorrow, uh, again, uh, 10 o'clock Brussels time, um, we will have the second part of this workshop. And what people will have noticed or might have noticed in, um, in this workshop is that this is not just organized by the European University Association and the University of Minho. Uh, we're also being supported by a membership service that the UA has, which is the Council for Doctoral Education. And uh, tomorrow that's going to become very apparent uh, why they're supporting uh, this workshop. Um, we've already touched upon it multiple times today. But the program tomorrow, and this is where CDE comes in, is uh, we're going to uh, expand further on a real sustainable implementation <clears throat> of these initiatives. Um, the Council of Doctoral Education is, is the membership service that, that works with universities across Europe uh, and their doctoral schools specifically on uh, essentially over the last 10, 12, maybe even 50 years, just implementing any type of sort of skills training on other topics, not just research data, but also other topics. So there's a wealth of um, information, a wealth of expertise, lessons learned in how to fully integrate uh, new types of skills, new types of training, so that they become part and parcel of, of the strategy that an institution has with its doctoral training. And, and tomorrow, I'm, I'm really looking forward to some of the presentations in what have we already learned from that experience over the last decade, and how can we apply that then specifically to research data management and then fair data skills. So uh, with that being said, I'm very happy to invite people to join again tomorrow, where we'll be expanding uh, on that topic. And for now, I think I can hand it back to Pedro for the closing words. Yes, so just to say thank you for your participation, for your active participation, contributing with questions and also in the in the Mentimeter in, in the chat. Uh, and see you tomorrow. I hope that uh, you can also join tomorrow. So we have more initiatives tomorrow. We have also this area specific of doctoral education uh, from the Council. So I think it will be a great second session <laughs> of, the, of this workshop and I hope that you can join. And many thanks for, for joining and many thanks for the speakers today for your effort. See you tomorrow. It should be in Portugal, but it fortunately is online in every, every place where we are. <laughs> bye bye. Obrigada. Bye. Right. Just we just keep the chat open for for one or two minutes. That if you want to copy any link that we shared, so.